Come on, can you clap those hands? Right where you are. We're gonna give God the ultimate praise. The fruit of our lips, the clapping of our hands. If you wanna stand, move around, we're gonna give every praise that's due Him today. Everybody say
glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And much like Asgard, the church is not a place, it's a people. So wherever you are right now, you have permission to transform into a sanctuary. Let's pray together. Excellent God, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for sustaining us and bringing us to this point of worship. And now, Lord, we ask that you might give us eyes to see and ears to hear, a heart to receive your presence in this very moment to the end that we might look a little bit more like your son, Jesus Christ, the only name by which we are saved. Let it be so in that mighty and miraculous name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Let us worship together. All right, Refuge, you know what time it is. We've been making fa a faith declaration all 2021 long, and here we are in July, and you should know it by now, but let's say it together. It should be already be on your screen. With all that I've been through, and with all my Savior has done, I declare He's bringing it all together for me in 2021. Somebody ought to give Him praise. But listen, it's time to pass the peace. It's time to take the love and the power and the peace that God has placed in your life and to share it with somebody else, whether through your device, whether through a comment section, or whether you have somebody there that you can give a hug to. Let's take some time and let's take the peace of God that he says he lets rest in us and let's pass it and share it with somebody else because we are one body in Christ. Even if we're not in each other's faces, let's be in each other's hearts. Let's pass the peace. Yo 
Father, we come to you in this moment thanking you for all that you are, all that you have done. Lord, we desire to hear from you. We've uh, come this far by faith. We have pushed through. We have uh, trusted you all week long. But now, Lord, we need to hear your voice very clearly. So I pray that in these next few moments that you might rescue me from me, use me for your glory. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight as I Stand as your mouthpiece. Speak through me to each and every need, each and every heart, each and every situation, so that people will hear your voice and will know what to do and how to walk. So have your way and glorify yourself in these next few moments, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, listen, uh, often it's uh, too easy to look at where we are, where we happen to be in life. Well, whatever that might mean, whatever that might look like for some. Uh, what we have to deal with, uh, what the hand that we've been dealt. Uh, and it's easy to look at where you are and what's around you and the things you struggle with and to be disappointed with your present circumstances. Uh, listen, I get it. Walking with Jesus, being a Jesus follower means learning how to manage the disappointments of life through the lenses of our faith so that we don't allow bitterness to creep into um, our lives, into our thinking, into our faith life, into our hope life. Um, because a, a faith perspective will keep its eyes on Jesus despite the circumstances around us. Uh, it, it will help us to remember that life in Him operates in seasons and in cycles. Uh, which means that where I am, whatever I'm dealing with now, wherever I am, is not where I'll always be. But sometimes when, when you and I find ourselves disappointed with the way things are and where things are in life, that, we, that faith perspective gets dimmed. Because listen, I have learned that bitterness 
is a criminal. <laughs> it's a smooth criminal. It, it steals our joy. It, 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 it robs us of the ability to, to enjoy where we are. It, it, it assaults our ability to love. It, it will, it will uh, do damage to our ability to reach out with lovingness and, and love towards other things and other people. And it can murder our faith. It's a smooth criminal. Bitterness is, is, is a terrible thing. Uh, that's why the Bible deals with it in two different places, in Deuteronomy 29 and 18, and then again in Hebrews 12 and 15, this idea of a root of bitterness. Now listen, in a couple of weeks you'll be able to see it uh, where I'll have my surgery, but uh, the, the crazy thing is that a few months after Lex is born, I had my first surgery with the same issue. Uh, but what they tell me is that when they took out the first uh, non, non-cancerous tumor, there were some seeds of some roots that were left that filtered down to a lower spot. And now I'm dealing with the same issue because there were roots that were left in from the first time. That's exactly what bitterness does. It, it, it roots itself in our hearts and in our minds and our ability to love, and it will keep creeping up and trying to infiltrate and infect whatever it touches. That's why Acts 8 and 23 deals with the poisonous of bitterness. It pollutes and it poisons our perspective our ability to see things and see things from a God perspective and from a faith perspective. That's why Ephesians 4 and 31 tells us that we have to put away bitterness. We have to choose not to be bitter because we because bitterness can always be there. If there's a root that's there, if there's something that's happened where we've lingered on the disappointment of what has happened too long and that root is there, it will crop up and watch this because it's a criminal it will seek to destroy whatever God is up to and what God desires to do next in our lives because we'll be so stuck on what happened, we won't be able to receive what's next. Well, let me show it to you. Somebody, well, Pastor, you ain't even read no verse yet. All right, here we go. I'm I'm gonna take you to this verse. I'm gonna illustrate it from this little story that's nestled into the story of Jacob and his family. And I'm gonna let us see, hopefully we'll be able to see um, what bitterness can do when we allow it to creep in. Look at Genesis 35. Genesis 35, verses 16 through 18. This is the story of Jacob. Now remember, Jacob has two wives and two side chicks. And out of those four women, he has at least 10 kids, 10 sons, at least one daughter. Uh, and where we pick up the story, his the wife that he loved, Rachel, uh, she had one son named Joseph. It was She had been barren for years and years and years. Finally, God answered her prayer, uh, but even in the midst of, of waiting to get Joseph, she, she was bitter towards her rivals, towards the other wives, one of whom was her sister. Um, she, she exhibited bitterness that, that they would walk in blessings, and yet she couldn't. Uh, you, you'll see it pop up as you read the Rachel's story in, in Genesis. You'll see it pop up several times. But now here she is pregnant with a second son. And let's pick up the story in verse 16. The Bible says that leaving Bethel, Jacob and his clan moved on toward Ephrath. But Rachel went into labor while they were still some distance away. Her labor pains, the Bible says, were intense. And verse 17 says, after a hard delivery, the midwife exclaimed, don't be afraid. You have another son. But verse 18 says, Rachel was about to die, but with her last breath, She named the baby Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrow. Stop the story right there. Watch this. Rachel had struggled all her life with this comparisons between herself and other people and what they had and what she didn't have. And there was this root of bitterness that was left in her life. So much so that even though she's at this point with a second son, with a second pregnancy, that that root of bitterness begins to creep in. And the Bible says that she had a hard delivery. Now, I, I can't be too judgmental because I've never had to give birth. Praise God for that. I have watched three. Um, but I, I, I recognize that, that this, this woman was, was not only just in a struggle, but it was literally draining the life from her. And as she was in the midst of this struggle of dealing with her pain and dealing with what it was going to take 
to bring about this new life into being, she got stuck because of her bitterness. She got stuck on the sorrow and the travail and the struggle and the pain. And even when the midwife comes in verse 17 and tries to change her perspective, oh, look, instead of worrying about, listen, you're about to give birth to a son. She's stuck in that place so much so, watch this, that she names the baby Ben-Oni. She names the baby after her struggle. She names the baby after her pain. She only saw struggle. Even in the midst of a joyous circumstance, she did not see potential. She saw struggle and she named the baby Ben-Oni. Now, listen, I have discovered that whenever we make decisions from a place of bitterness in our lives, we initiate negative cycles in our lives. We, We start a process of cyclical living where that bitterness will keep popping up and will keep creeping up and will keep robbing and stealing and assaulting and murdering the great things that God wants to do. Uh, Whenever we make decisions from a place of bitterness, we stay stuck in in these cycles. We initiate them, but then we stay stuck in them. And and the negativity that we start and the negativity that we exhibit becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So much so that even when God blesses, we anticipate it's going to be just like the last time. We anticipate that it's not going to work. We anticipate it's going to be a struggle. We anticipate that it's not really going to be a blessing. And listen, I have discovered this. And I pray that you do too, that you and I learn to, listen, if you missed this, you missed the whole message. Here's the message. Never limit your future based upon your present circumstances. Let me say that again. Don't ever limit what God can do based upon your bitterness and being stuck in where you happen to be right now. She named the baby. She called his name son of sorrow, son of sickness. You make me sick. You, you're killing me. You're, you're dragging me down. You, you are a place of pain and bitterness for me. That's what she was going to name the baby. And the Bible says so much so that even with her last breath, the last thing she could do was to focus on the pain and the bitterness and the struggle and the sorrow based upon what she had from her past. But listen, I have discovered that whenever we make decisions based upon purpose, when we look at potential, when we look at where we're going, when we look at who is in charge and in control, when we look at what God's promises are, when we look at at what can be in spite of what has been, when we, when we operate in that, we hit a reset button in our lives and we start to see actual progress being made. Because watch what happens that even as Rachel with her dying breath calls him son of my sorrow, the daddy has to step in. Jacob has to step in and names him Benjamin, son of my right hand. The, the, the right hand in ancient uh, New, Near Eastern cultures was this idea of favor, was this idea of strength, was this idea of purpose and power. She said, you're the son of my sorrow. She changed, he, the daddy had to change his name to son of promise, son of power, son of potential. He, when, when he hit the reset button. Even though Rachel gave her last breath being bitter, God began to do something different in the life of Benjamin. As a matter of fact, if you study um, the, the, the tribe of Benjamin, you'll notice that the first king of Israel, Saul, he came from Benjamin. You'll notice that, uh, that as you study, there were great warriors in Benjamin, which is interesting because he was son of my right hand, but they were known for being left-handed warriors, that, that they could sneak up on you and do things that you couldn't expect. Even the Apostle Paul was a, a descendant of the tribe of Benjamin, that, that out of that place of bitterness, out of that place of sorrow, out of that place of looking at and focusing on the present circumstances, rather than seeing the future and the potential because bitterness had robbed her of her faith, God stepped in and God hit the reset button. And that which had been cursed as, as, as being sorrowful because of bitterness, God turned into a thing of victory and power and purpose and potential and yes, even praise. Now I pray that you and I wouldn't allow bitterness, whatever was done was done. But in Jesus Christ, we are brand new creations 
all things are made new. So it does not matter what was, it doesn't matter what the cycles have been in your family. Don't stay stuck and don't stay limited by the, the sorrow of what was, but keep trusting him. Keep believing that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think. Put that bitterness in the past. Dig that root out. Choose on a daily basis to operate in hope and faith and watch God hit the reset button and move things forward in our lives. Can I pray for us? Father, we thank you. We bless you. We magnify your great name that you're the one who knows how to take that which has been cursed by humans and you can turn it into a blessing that keeps on blessing. And so Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus for every person who is struggling with disappointment, who is struggling with the, the bitterness of something that was done, something that was said, something that was, that was done to them, that they were victimized by, and they've stayed stuck in those places. I speak a release by the blood of Jesus in their lives right now. I declare freedom from that bitterness. I declare that you are healing and reconciling their hearts and their minds and their emotions, even now in the name of Jesus and you're taking that thing that has been cursed by our bitterness and you're turning it into a thing of purpose and power so Lord we thank you and we bless you in Jesus name for restoring our perspective restoring our hope restoring our faith and we believe that you're able to take that which looks like has been a curse for us and you're turning it into something great and we receive it and we believe it in Jesus name amen Listen, we're up to that moment of our worship experience where we worship God in giving. We've given worship through song. We've given worship through our time and attention to his word. Now let's worship even in our sacrifice as we take a portion of that which God has blessed us with in our own personal lives and our personal finances. And let's show our appreciation. Let's show our covenant connection to him by worshiping him in giving. There's different ways, different methods that you can give, but remember, we always give as unto the Lord, as a sign that we recognize his overlordship, his ruling and reigning over our lives. And we tithe up and we sow into the kingdom of God through this opportunity to worship God in giving. Now, don't forget, in just a few moments, you'll see all of the things that we uh, are have as announcements, the things that are upcoming in the life of the Refuge Church in the next week that we want you to know about. But let's, as we scroll those, let's not let that take away from this opportunity to worship God in giving. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We magnify your name. You have been good to us. God, you've been better than we deserve to be treated. Uh, you, you are amazing in our lives. You, you, you're paying our bills and you're making ways out of no ways. And you're even blessing us beyond measure. And now, God, I pray that as we recognize your lordship in our lives, that as we sow back into your kingdom, as we give as unto you, as we sow seeds, we ask, God, that you would take these gifts, not for the monetary value, but for the heart value, and that you would multiply them, and stretch them, and use them to manifest your kingdom here on earth as it already is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship God in our giving. Listen, the old folks uh, in the church that I grew up in, I used to hear him say all the time. May, I used to hear him say all the time, "May the Lord God bless you, real good." I pray that you will walk in the blessings of God this week because of your relationship, the ongoing, growing relationship that you and I develop in our following after Jesus. Can I pray for us, Father? We thank you. We magnify you. You're a good God. You are amazing. 
Uh, we see your hand at work all around us and we anticipate and expect by faith that you're going to do no less in and around and through our lives on this week. I pray, God, that you would take those promises that you have given us in your word and that you would manifest them in the lives of your people through peace, through power, through provision, and even in prosperity. May we reflect and shine the light of Jesus in everything that we do and everywhere that we go. Now, God, I pray that you would stand up strong in your people. We bless you and we magnify you. May the love of the Father, may, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in each of us both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. May you have a great week in the Lord. May you see the hand of God. I love you. There's nothing that you can do about it. Can't wait to see you back here next week.